Welcome to the 73rd episode of the Game 4 Podcast. In this episode, we'll talk about the things that we're looking forward to that we saw at the Gamma Expo. I'm Adam. And I'm Matt. And this is the Game 4 Podcast. Game 4 is a platform to help connect tabletop gamers and to help you get more out of your tabletop gaming. Matt and I are part of a software development and design company called Milkan. And because most of the folks at Milkan love tabletop games, we developed the Game 4 app and launched it in early 2018. We launched this companion podcast in June 2019 to help tabletop gamers get more enjoyment out of their hobby. Due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, we hibernated the Game 4 app in July of 2020 and plan to bring back a retooled version of the app for Android, iOS, and web when gaming in person is safer. Until then, we'll keep bringing you this podcast to help you get more out of your tabletop gaming. (laughs) So we had a heck of a week last week, didn't we? Yeah, it was kind of a whirlwind. Yeah, um, a day of flying in and out of Reno. Well, basically, yeah, a day a day going and a day coming back. It's, yeah. yeah, especially with delays. Did we, we got delayed both ways. Both ways. Wow. It was worse the way out there, mainly because we were concerned about connecting flights. Yeah, they yeah. actually held the plane for us for like an hour. Almost an hour. Well, it wasn't just for us. No, there was no like... on the way from Salt Lake to Reno because well, yeah, we landed in Salt Lake real late because we left from Minneapolis real late. But it wasn't just us. There was like twenty six people on yeah. our plane that needed to get to Reno. So yeah, it kind of made sense. So that was nice of them to do that. Yeah, I'm sure that the other people were not happy. It was late enough at night that they probably weren't making connecting uh, flights in the yeah, in the no, middle of the night. I doubt you would go to Reno to connect to something else. Oh God, I can't even think that's possible. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Like nothing, <laughs> nothing comes to Reno except for Salt Lake City, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, much. it's uh, yeah, it's it's a bit tough getting out there. Um, but we did finally get there sometime after midnight, technically local time. Yeah, and then we went to the hotel, and mm-hmm. then we had to stay in the line for a long time to get our keys and stuff, and so we went to bed pretty late on Monday night. Yeah, I remember I had no trouble falling asleep that night. Yeah, I had a hard time staying asleep. I don't know. I just have a hard time sleeping in hotels. Yeah. But uh, falling asleep was not initially the issue. Yeah. And then on Tuesday, we, I don't know, kind of talked to some folks. And Tuesday's kind of the easier day. You set up the booth. Um, right. so ours takes uh, almost 10 minutes. I think it took a little over 10 minutes, like maybe yeah. 11 minutes. Right. It's a, yeah, it's, <laughs> we got it down to a science. Also, yeah. we don't have like, you know, a, a huge booth and structures kind. and product and yeah no yeah which is basically us standing in front of a bunch of pop-up things and it works out quite nice mm-hmm. um and then wednesday afternoon is the beginning technically of the trade show portion of the trade show where you you know store owners and all that kind of stuff walk around and look at all the people in the booths mm-hmm. and we stare at them and you know all that kind of right. jazz. it's very aquarium feeling a little bit yeah they tap on the glass every once in a while it's not very nice you're not supposed to do that um but yeah, so that's only from like one until six. Yeah, the yeah. first day isn't too bad. No, yeah, and then uh, the second day oh. of the, that's uh, nine until six for no reason, as far as we can tell. Right. Good and, lord! And they they pretty much uh, require you to mortgage your second and third house to uh, get chairs in that place. Yeah, so we didn't have any chairs. So and I can't sit down on the floor. Indian or whatever you call it these days, uh, cross-legged. Crisscross applesauce, I think. I like cross-legged. That seems shorter than crisscross applesauce. Yeah. I, uh, but it's better than what I was about to say there, yes. I think. Um, yeah, it's just me being old, and that's what we used to call it. But, um, yeah, no. Uh, I, I mean, I can do it if I have to. It's right. just not it's, great. And no. it's, it's hard getting down there and hard to get back up, especially after a long day of standing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, next time we might bring some chairs or decide to pay for chairs i guess there's that too we'll see how that goes yeah well there was people that were like oh i just went and bought chairs and then i will like just leave them i think we could get inflatable chairs those would be cool Mm. maybe not that cool i don't know but it'd be easy to pack it would be easy to pack. Be hard to inflate though maybe stools like the fold-up stools would fit in there oh you know what we should do Mm. camp chairs the camping chairs oh yeah yeah those would fit pretty nicely yeah they might fit in there along with the rest of our stuff yeah yeah anyway right. anyway yeah so um we could make <laughs> you, the, we turn the, entire, the chair talk <laughs> yeah exactly we could turn the entire uh, booth into like a like a campsite yes uh that'd be a, a change of uh of, of venue but yeah, and then on Friday it was uh, getting up at two thirty in the morning, and so that we could be on the flight at six a.m. and then um, just barely make that flight. 
Yeah, um, yeah. I, I was touch and go. I was starting to get a little nervous. Yeah, there. bag check in took way longer than we expected, right. and then and you're like, why didn't you check in ahead of time? We're like, we did, but yeah. for some reason they're like, you know, the bag drop off is was merged with the check in, and right. they still only had like two people working it or three. But, but and most of those people that were in the line with us were not there to get just check in. They were there to drop off bags. Too. Right, and yeah, it just yeah. took forever. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, like we found like the one lady that worked on us, she had to ask everybody else the same question over and over again. Yeah, she was not particularly efficient but uh you know it, yeah it was you know it's bad when they're like hey if you're on this flight you should come to the front of like go in front of everybody because you're gonna miss your flight right and yeah, yeah yeah the ladies the manager she's like you guys need to hurry up this is not good <laughs> it was, yeah it was it was uh it was weird but we we did eventually get home and and all things came with us we had got all of our luggage and everything so yeah. that's good um while we were there we had uh I don't know. We saw a bunch of people that we knew and haven't mm-hmm. seen in a couple of years. Um, yeah. Saw John Caspian from Gigabytes Cafe, the big, 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 big game store down near uh, Atlanta, mm-hmm. outside of Atlanta, Marietta, Georgia. Um, hadn't seen him in a while. And um, I ran into um, Brent from Goobertown Hobbies YouTube mm-hmm. channel. And, I got to meet him for yeah. the first time. And Casey from eBay Miniature Rescue. Yes. And um, had dinner with them one night. And um, and then we had dinner with, not Casey, but Brent was still there, though, and some other folks. We went to that. That was um, Wednesday night. We went mm. to the steak place. Yep. Yeah, yeah. With Lee Gaddis and from Lee Gaddis from Gaddis Gaming, absolutely. So yeah, no, it was good to it was good to see people. It was kind of good to be back. I mean, we were all wearing masks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. We were there in the convention center, but it was uh, it was good to be back. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say all the retailers came back, but they're more than I expected to be. Yeah, no, it was it was good that way too. So that was our last week, but mm-hmm. it's been two weeks since the last show, and uh, you know we've done things. What kind of things yeah. have uh, have you done recently? I I did finally get to play board games because like the last time I think I had said I had canceled because of uh, illness, mm-hmm. so uh, got yeah, to reschedule. You were sick. Yeah, so got to reschedule and play uh, a day of board games. Um, I think it was a Saturday before I flew out. Um, Played a game from a Kickstarter called Nova Atis, maybe. Okay. Maybe that's how it's spelled. Well, I'm looking at the else? notes here. You got Nova. I got. I can read that. Yeah, Nova, that... and then A E T A S. Yeah, uh, it's an Italian creator game. Okay, um, but it's kind of like Imperial Salt meets D and D. So there's minis. Um, actually has cardboard like terrain that becomes 3D terrain. Oh, that's kind of cool. And so there's actually rules for climbing and getting up and down and yeah, all yeah. that stuff. Um, so we played that. It was, I would say, interesting. So Imperial Salt, that's the Star Wars game from Fantasy Flight that's mm-hmm. kind of a grid-based, kind right. of uh, skirmishy sort of thing. Yep. It doesn't really have terrain so much as you're just kind of playing it on a board. That right. Simulates so this one, terrain. Yeah, so this one has cardboard terrain, so it gives you a little bit more feel, yeah, um, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Um I don't we did the tutorial. Um, it did take a little while because we had to get everything set up and punched out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this was the first time play then. Yeah, and then we nearly died until we in realized the game. Yeah, and then, okay. In, in the tutorial, we're like, "Holy cow!" Like, oh, okay. One, we it's kind of like it was geared towards like four players, mm-hmm. but we only had three, and I didn't see anywhere where you were supposed to do something different for less players. Sure. So I, that might have been why it seemed really difficult. And then we realized that you were just supposed to get from one end of the board to the other end of the board. And we were all fast enough and quick enough that we could do that. Yeah, okay. So we realized that maybe that was the other thing. We weren't really supposed to be fighting these guys. That we were just supposed to be running to, away. We were supposed to be kind of like getting through them. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, So it might have been trying to teach us that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Or we just kind of cheated and that we weren't supposed to do that. And sure. But yeah, yeah, it was it was all right. I, I'd be willing to try it again and and see you know explore it a little bit further. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it was it was different. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but then after that, uh, I got to bring out my copy of Return to Dark Tower. So that is one of the new restoration games 
based off of an old game from oh, the 80s. Yes. Right? With or was like it the, the 70s. No, it's no, the 80s. 80s. Yeah, 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 with like the, the back then it was like, oh, it, it like has a little voice chip so it talks to you. Yeah, it was like a plastic tower in the middle of the board that right. to put batteries in it and sometimes Yeah, it talks. this thing, I mean, it spins and uh, has a bunch of stuff and it interacts with the app and has okay. sound and LED lighting and nice. everything. Um, when we first started, we were very underwhelmed. Um, and we were kind of playing it a little bit, trying to go, and then we realized that it wasn't advancing. And that's when we realized that even though it thought it was connected, it wasn't really fully actually connected, so we had to restart everything. And when we restarted it, then everything made sense, and then like, the brilliance of like the app was actually very nicely done. Uh, good, clean graphics, easy mm-hmm. to follow. Um, it just wasn't connecting fully initially. Yeah. So then all of a sudden we're like, oh, now it's way cooler. Like it had like fight sounds and yeah. growling sounds when beasts were attacking you. And nice. Um, at the end of each turn, you drop a skull into the tower mm-hmm. that may or may not pop back out at you or it may pop back out at you later on or come out a different side of the tower depending on where it spins that's kind of cool um but that signals the end of the turn and then that advances stuff and then they kind of you know spawn events and stuff for you but now you did the kickstarter on this yes but is it something that's going to be available in stores yes okay Uh, probably not currently it sounds like they might even do a second run of the kickstarter because they've had so much issues like getting it shipped over that um and so much demand for it but and I think the shipping costs are so high for it right now. Yeah, I'll bet, I'll I, bet. They're probably trying to figure out a way to like group a bunch of orders because I to make it more cost effective. Yeah, I can understand it. That makes sense. Because yeah, I want to say that they were saying something like it needs to be like four hundred dollars to be able to to like effectively uh, sell it in mm-hmm. the U.S. with like the shipping and everything right now. Where I I don't. I think I paid one fifty. Yeah, and that's yeah, four hundred bucks is not going to probably fly for most folks. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it's a it's a great game, but sure. I I would probably even balk at the four hundred. You could get a probably an Xbox for four hundred bucks or a baseball bat. I found out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. My son bought a we bought my son a new baseball bat for uh, this last weekend, which is why uh, Adam was ju- laughing. Yes, because um, I. I was figuring, eh, 100 150 bucks would probably be a nice bat. Mm-hmm. No, not even close. So now you did not buy the four hundred dollar baseball bat. I did not buy. Well, it was three fifty, but, well, it, but it's still. It was, does it have LED light? LED lights? It doesn't. You, you it would doesn't. think it would be like and you Bluetooth can't put a skull in it or nothing. That's that's well, no, you know, I know. I'm just saying, right? Just another another check mark in the uh, tabletop gaming uh, column, right there. You know, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, well, yeah. Poor decisions were made. Yeah, well, you know. Um, but yeah, we played it. Um, I highly recommend. Really, I really liked it. So if you can get your hands on it, though, if yeah. you can get your hands on it, if you could play it like a demo copy or something yeah, yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, I I thought it was. So besides great. that and Fireball Island, what have they done other stuff like that? Uh, let's see. They've got that. The latest one is that um, kind of like. Um, are they doing a car war? Car war type thing. It's not car war. Thunder Road, Thund- maybe yeah. something like that. Yep. Okay, yeah, they're yeah, doing yeah. that. Um, yeah. Oh, and I just went by the booth of Gamma, and I'm trying to think yeah, of the yeah, other yeah. ones. But, I, yeah, those are the kind of the two big ones that they yeah. got. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's an interesting concept of, like, going back. Because, like, initially when I first heard about Restoration Games, I'm just like, oh, so they're just going to reprint a bunch of old stuff and nostalgia. But they've, they're they not doing that. They're no, they're kind of, like... Definitely updating and really... Yeah, they're kind yeah. of making it, like, it's one of those things, like... Where you know you're like, oh, this game was amazing in the past, and if you went back to it, you'd be like, oh, right, yeah, rose-colored glasses, exactly. But I kind of feel like they're making it so you're like, oh, this is, this, yeah, this is the, the game I remember it being. Yeah, no, it's a smart move. You've got to like almost over, um, you know, uh, over deliver because people are comparing it to their like what they used to remember that right. kind of thing. You know, yeah, like I, yeah, like Fireball Island was way better than the original was. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was kind of like what I expected the game to be when I saw it on TV. Like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, it looks amazing! And then you got it, and you're like, uh, yeah. Do you remember the old Mousetrap game? Oh, I still, re- I, the, I, my kids had Mousetrap nice. again. It was nearly impossible to actually get that Mousetrap to work. It yeah. is, it is, a, it is a, is a mess. I, yeah. so I forget which relative hated me and got my kids that. Um, 
The uh, you know what uh, they should restoration hardware should, or not? I keep saying restoration hardware. That's like a architectural salvage place or something like yeah. that. Uh, our, uh, restoration games should redo that, but I don't think they. Well, they did Fireball Island, and that was probably Parker Brothers or Milton Bradley or one of those big guys, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, they must have but, bought, bought the license away from them. Yeah, but I think Mousetrap is still being made. Is the no, issue. that's a good point. You're right. Yeah, they haven't been producing Fireball Island for a long time, but yeah, Mousetrap might still be available. Yeah, they should just make that into an app. They should pay oh, us. They, should, they, they should pay us to make it into an app. They, they should, should just do. forget about that wow, yeah. game. And... Um, nice. But yeah, that was about, so. Yeah, that uh, and then getting ready for Adepticon is about it. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. Um, let's see. So, like I said, I was out of town for a week in Reno, Nevada, where the weather was eh, it's fine. It was all right. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Wasn't anything fancy. I mean, there's been years before where there, it snowed like a lot. Yeah, there was. Yeah, it's people like trying like, to go out into the pool, and right. I'm like, there's six inches of snow out there. What are you doing? Yeah, it's typically like slightly colder there than it is here. Sometimes, yeah. This time, yeah, there was at least one day where it was warmer in Wisconsin than it was in uh, Reno. Nevada. Yeah, because I, I get back and everyone's like, "Oh, you know, was it nice? You go sit outside in the sun and get a suntan." I'm like, "No, that's not what Reno is. <laughs> yeah, Reno, yeah. Reno is not Vegas. No, 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 definitely." It's like Denver. Yeah, more with closer. less, with harder to get to. Yeah, that's oh, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So let me see. Well, so I didn't stream on Twitch at all that week. I was gone, obviously, because that would have been tough. Aww. I know. Uh, I'll be streaming tonight. We're recording this Yay. on a Monday, so um, it may by the time you see this, it'll or listen to this, it'll have already happened. But there you are. Um, one thing I did do this weekend after we got back from Reno was I finished up two pieces of terrain two shrines okay. that I'll be using in Rain and Hell demos at Adepticon. So I'll also be going to Adepticon. I'm leaving on Wednesday morning. And on Friday night, probably around 8 p.m. local time, I believe, roughly, uh, we're going to be doing, me and Vince and whomever else wants to come and hang out with us, we're we'll doing some demos of Rain and Hell up on the second floor in the free gaming area. You'll see us because you'll see me. I'm kind of big. Um, I don't have a flag or anything like that, though. I should have a flag. You should. Yeah, I know. Um, so, yeah, those two pieces of terrain. One of them I did most of the a good portion of the day on Saturday. It was like when I left for Reno, it was built. And everything was textured and it was ready to be primed. And then so on Saturday morning, I primed it base colored a lot of it with the airbrush, primed it with the airbrush, then also mm-hmm. base colored a lot of it with the airbrush, then um, had to do a lot of like shading and weathering and some of this and that and some other stuff with washes and whatnot. And then it was, of course, the actual base itself. And then, you know, there's a couple of skulls on it, of course, because why wouldn't there be? And just all that kind of stuff. And so it's just a lot of little details. It's like one of those things where you're like, you know, it takes you an hour to get the primer and all the base mm-hmm. color, and you're covered now 97% of it, and now the last 3% takes the rest of the day. You know what nice. I mean? Yeah. Dry brushing and this and that and all kinds of stuff. So, um, But I, I really like the way it turned out. Uh, the The main centerpiece of the terrain piece, um, and I'll probably post it on Instagram at some point soon, um, um, under Tabletop Minions, uh, the main piece of it is a chunk of of hollow plastic from a company called Mammoth Miniatures. It's the same uh, guy that makes Planet 28, which I've talked oh, about before. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah he's also, um, he's gotten into um, not just like game design, but he also loves making things too. And he has started to, he has his own plastic injection molder, which is weird because he's not using steel, but he's using something else yeah. for the miniature or for the molds and stuff. And it's, huh. yeah, it's, it, they're, they're not, the, they're not super crazy high quality, but they're actually not bad. Um, and then this thing I think is what you call a pour mold. Okay. It's like a one piece mold and you just kind of pour stuff into it and sort of move it around a bunch until it starts sticking to the sides of the mold and you just pour in, but it's hollow on the inside. It's mm. like a big monolith. It's oh, just totally kind of like chocolate. Like, cho- they do yeah, like like a chocolate rabbit, but but instead yeah. of but it would be like if it had a hole where its feet was, and you were just pouring chocolate in there and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Also, don't eat this one. This that will not turn out well. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the central piece of the terrain, and then WizKids, the the folks that make the unpainted but like pre primed miniatures for Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and all that kind of junk. They have all kinds of things that are not like people or monsters. They have like. You know, cannons and, uh, you know, uh, oh, yeah. carts and wagons and all kinds of junk like that. They also have a bunch of, like, kind of broken 
like uh, pillars and, and stuff like that. They do, yeah. So I had bought one of those pillar sets, and I used a couple of those pillars. I put the whole thing on a big chunk of MDF and whatever, and so it will work well. And then the other piece that I finished up was the base on that Reaper one that I've talked about in the past. Yeah, did that is that did that stay flat then? It did, it did. Yeah, nice. I was concerned that um, <laughs> that eventually the plastic was going to start to bend the MDF, which is like at it might I don't think it's quarter inch, maybe it's eighth inch. I don't know, but it's sturdy MDF. But yeah. I was concerned, but uh, it seems to be good. So I'll be taking those with me to Adepticon so that uh, we'll have a, a, a shrine on each of the two boards you're going to be running. So that'll be fun. Um, otherwise, I've got to finish up. I have two Cabals of Demons painted, but one of them, their base is not finished. So I have to finish their bases, and I'm probably going to end up using uh, my three hours tonight on Twitch to do it because otherwise I don't know where I'm going to find the time between now and Wednesday morning. So, uh, yeah, that's that's that'll be the last bit of hobby I get done before I gallivant off to uh, beautiful Schaumburg, Illinois. Uh, where I will probably stay in the building the entire time I'm there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's that. It may it may be beautiful, but I have no idea because I'll be inside. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much me, I think. Um, what else? We don't have any real... Um, we don't currently have any other information on the app or anything. We haven't been able to because we were, you know, out of town. Right. Um, that being said, we do have the survey, which closes today. So by the time that you hear this, yep. you, it'll be closed. So thank you to everybody who um, helped fill, helped us out by filling out the survey. We yeah, had, we, last I looked, 126, I think. Yeah, which was, I think, pretty decent. Yeah, it was a decent amount of uh, people. Uh, answering our our questions and stuff. So thank you for for that. I think that possibly our next episode we may touch on what we've learned. You know that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, I can I see think. us sharing some of some of the interesting tidbits. Indeed, indeed. So, like we've mentioned several times already, we just got back from Gamma. If you don't know what that means, that's Gamma is the Game Manufacturers Association, which. Still just should spell GMA, but it spells Gamma. I don't know why. Every time. I know. Um, but so anyway, the Gamma Expo, and it is a yearly convention that sh- they didn't have last year, obviously. That, mm-hmm. It was virtual or something. Right, yeah. yeah. But, but like 2020, they did have it because it was yes. just before everything went to crap. Yeah, basically everybody that was – a lot of people that were coming from overseas canceled mm-hmm. at the last minute and – even some that even were some people domestically, low. yeah. And we went, and it was really weird. Everybody was kind of like, didn't know what to do. Like and nobody was wearing masks, but everybody was like hand sanitizing constantly. Yeah, we didn't lot, know it. That, that was point. when you first, yeah, like the first time I ever like gave somebody the elbow instead of the, the shaking hands. Yeah, yeah, the shaking hands. Uh, There's fist bumps and mm-hmm. elbows. Um, somebody let loose a balloon because they thought it was funny about the whole yeah, that was, that COVID was thing, yeah. which didn't go over very well. <laughs> right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then all of a sudden, like, the NCAA March Madness and NHL and NBA all can't, canceled, and then everybody started taking it very seriously. And Right. We were, like, at a restaurant, and we were, it had, like, TVs up, like, almost, almost not, not a sports bar, but they had stuff yeah, up was, for sports, everybody kind just, of just everything like, just started canceling like, all at once. Yeah, they, everyone was kind of like, oh, and then, and then Adepticon canceled, mm-hmm. and then we're like, oh, hopefully we can get home. Yeah, exactly, and that was the concern about getting back actually actually home. I remember the flight on the way home was like nearly empty. Yeah, it I was, got I found a picture just recently on my phone where it was like yeah, it was like an empty plane. Just which is good because yeah, we didn't have masks, and at the think at the time there were, I don't know if they were trying to keep people from panicking and buying up all the masks or what. The yeah, was, I don't know. Like masks wasn't a thing really. It was like eh, masks aren't going to help you. you know, yeah, but but that was the last convention that we'd ever that we had gone to before everything, and so. Um, we only, like, you know, Gen Con missed 2020 and 2021. Most conventions missed 20 and 21. This trade show only missed 21, really. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it was still good to get back and see people and, and hang out. And the, the trade show, basically, the booths at the trade show, it's not a gaming convention. You don't go there to buy stuff, really. Right. So, yeah, it's more for businesses, uh, you know, store owners, game store owners and their employees and such to come to the convention and they're the ones that are walking up and right. down the they're learning about the new products yeah. uh, 
possibly registering with new pub with new distributors, mm-hmm. um, learning about new games. Lots of demos going on. Um, some like independent game companies are trying to get a publisher to or a distributor yeah. uh, interested in them um, or their product, whatever they've come up with. It's like so, there's a little bit of a mini Shark Tank going on for some booths, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for the most part, it's like established companies kind of saying like, "Here's the new hotness for this year." and why you should carry it, uh, make sure you pre-order and all that stuff. Yeah, and the booths are basically all manned by either publishers, manufacturers, distributors, um, companies like us that cater to uh, retailers and also potentially, you know, publishers, manufacturers, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, it's business-oriented. It's all people doing business, and it's business things, and it's serious. Except there's pictures of, like, Pikachu and, like, dragons and, like, all kinds of crap on all the, you know, and anime girls and all kinds of stuff like that on the, some cosplay people walking around. Not very many, but there's a couple. I don't remember that at all. The the knight. There was the knight and the chain. Oh, yeah, that was, yeah. I think that guy was just a store owner that just liked to cosplay. Yeah. Uh, That's fine. Yeah, And there was, like, another guy with, like, the feather outfit, like, the purple feathers. That I don't remember. Yeah. But anyway, I do remember the guy who had chainmail on, and we had a long discussion about whether or not... How he got through security, yeah. Right, exactly. How do you get through security or something like that? Um, <laughs> that's a good point. But uh, yeah, so uh, one of the things that's nice, though, is that there are lots of new games being shown off very frequently before the public sees them to some degree. Right, or know? yeah, or at least this is the first time you can see them in person. Right, you know? yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see. Well, well, should we just alternate back and forth? Cause yeah, I think so. Yeah, well, yeah. let's talk about some of the stuff we saw that were like, ooh, this is stuff that uh, we're going to keep a, an eye on this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the first things I saw that I was very interested in was, um, well, first of all, Titan Forge was there. Now, Titan Forge is a Polish company, and they generally they first started by just basically having a Patreon and making lots and lots of STLs, lots mm-hmm. of STL files for 3D printing. And they were one of the earliest that I know of uh, Patreon folks where it was like, hey, pay us nine or ten bucks a month and you get 20 plus, you know, right. STLs every single month. And they've just kind of skyrocketed in that. I mean, they've, you know, at roughly nine to ten bucks a month, they've got, I don't know, seven to eight thousand people who are in their Patreon paying them that much mm-hmm. every single month, you know. Which adds up pretty fast. Yes, it does. So, um, so that's awesome. Uh, and I think I don't know if this is the first show that they've done. In, I don't remember them. I've never seen them at a show before, which is why it was interesting. And I've watched yeah. their stuff for a long time because I like a lot of their models. So I was like, "Hey, cool!" And I've I've interacted a bit with some of the folks. I've interacted with the owner of the company, uh, Roman. Um, and so Roman wasn't there, I don't think. But I talked to Jacob and, and that someone kind of said stuff. they saw him there, but who knows? Yeah. I mean, he wasn't at the booth when I was there, right. but he might have been there at the actual convention. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, but the they were showing off they weren't just like hey look stls because the store owners are like yeah we don't we don't care about that you know that right. makes sense i get that but because they've been making you know, like you know good money they've started getting into game design so mm-hmm. they uh have a game that is coming out or is out i'm not sure called lobotomy 2 i think there's more to it than that lobotomy 2 colon something, something. i don't remember what um <laughs> But yeah, and uh, it's a little bit of a zombicide kind of a thing. Is it the asylum? Maybe it's the asylum. I don't know. It might be. You're it. in like an asylum, and you're trying to get out, but there's all kinds of scary monsters who are all, you know. Uh, as one would expect. Exactly. If you've ever been into, um, uh, you know, that's not true. I was going to say, if you've ever been into a medical facility, there's always like a guy who's got a hook for a hand and two heads and all that kind of stuff. That's that's not true at all. Uh, but in this game, that is ca- kind of the case. Mm-hmm. So um, instead of, like, selling you a game and being like, hey, why don't you print that stuff out? Why not? Instead, they're, like, doing resin and the whole deal. And I don't think it's right. 3D printed resin. I, well, I mean, the master is probably 3D printed, but they're pouring actual resin and all that stuff. Right. So um, you're buying a box that has the mats and the rules and the cards and the little tokens and no. all the figures, too. But could you print it yourself, too? Like That's a, a good question. I don't know if you could buy that separately and do that, yeah. but... Um, but it was interesting. But okay. the other game that they were also showing off there is the one that I was much more interested in, and it is called Blood Fields, and it is a small s- skirmish uh, miniature style game. It's played. It seems to be played on a relatively small, like almost the size of Kill Team or Warcry, which is like twenty-two by thirty. This 
this might have been they might have had it set up on a 24 by 36 or something like that but pretty close um and they are starting to sell miniatures for it as well again poured resin but you could also just buy the stls and crank them out yourself in that Mm -hmm. situation because they're really the way that they're selling blood fields which i think is really interesting is that they're not selling you the rules at all they are either selling you stls Mm -hmm. or they are selling you poured resin starter sets so you get, I don't know, five, ten miniatures inside that starter set. Mm-hmm. And then the rules are all online. So you can download a free PDF and then have that. But then also the army builders online, the roster cards, like all that stuff. It's actually, the website's not like spectacular looking, but it's incredibly mm-hmm. functional. It's just like, I think it's bloodfields.net. And you go there, you can download the PDF, or you can read the PDF directly through the website. Uh, not on mobile, though. It doesn't seem to work on mobile or tablet, only on desktop. But mm-hmm. you can download it, you know, on whatever. And then, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's it's interesting. Um, I, I, I've been looking at it a little bit since the show, and I want to um, look at it a little bit more. The only thing that's putting me off a little bit right now is it seems like they're working with custom dice, and I want to see if there's a way to not do that. But, mm-hmm. uh yeah, otherwise it's it's an interesting kind of fantasy, like weird fantasy, um, not like the standard normal, like, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings style tropes. There's yeah, a lot of weird crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Because, you know, I mean, it makes sense at this point. They've put out so many models in the last, I don't know, five, four or five years or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. it would be a good idea just to take a bunch of them and try to make a game around them. So why not? Uh, so yeah, Bloodfields I thought was very interesting from Titan Forge, and I want to really get into checking out the game, reading the rules, understanding it better, and then deciding on where to go from there. Nice. What about you? Um, let's see. The first thing that I was kind of surprised to see there was a company called Yarrow Studios. I think I talked about them a couple years ago. Um, here when on I, the podcast? Yeah, here on mm-hmm. the podcast when I talked about their... Um, battle map tome like it was a book of that like i think it was like 40 maps that you could flip to and they're all kind of like it was like a water map or like a forest map for D. are they spiral bound no but okay. they the way they did bind it it's uh it does lay flat okay gotcha. which was pretty awesome that yeah, they yeah. figured out how to do that how big is this book um ooh, let's see try to think of a it's like She's a foot by two feet. Oh, okay. Like it's so it's a big, per- tall book. Yeah, and then yeah, so yeah. when it flips out, it's probably um, it's probably pretty close to a two by two grid. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's and it's like aimed towards like D and D or or role playing in general. Yeah, so they had D and D. That was the initial one, and then they did a sci fi version, mm-hmm. um, which it sounded like it did pretty well. Then the last thing I heard about, they did the infinite maps, which was like basically a scroll. So everything was rolled. It was a rolled up map, but it was like 40 feet long or something like that. No kidding. Yeah, it was insane, Um, which they actually used a bunch of them as their backdrops behind their booth. Oh, at the the show? Yeah, Yeah, I I remember seeing that. Um, But their latest thing, um, apparently there was a Kickstarter for it. I missed it, um, called um, the Immersive Battle Atlas, Mm -hmm. um, which is like their book, except they're all individual pages that are laminated. Uh, so, and it comes in like a, the book, it looks kind of like the book, except it's, it's more, more like a, a folder folder. Yeah. 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 Um, the funny thing was I, as I was looking at it, my, the owner of my friendly local game store, I like buying stuff from was mm-hmm. looking as well and it was putting in an order. So, um, it sounds like I'll be able to get one from him as soon as they come in, but which is nice. But yeah, um, the thing that they, they said that was nice about these is that, uh, you could combine multiple maps together, mm-hmm. um, and then and the fact that they truly lay flat, not just a book flat, uh, it, was, it was easier to use like three D terrain set up on top of it. So if you have like this, you know, city cobblestone, and then you put buildings on top of it, and stuff, yeah, it yeah, worked yeah. Out well, that makes sense. Cool, yeah, and they're all full color and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, yep. Probably one inch grid, I assume. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, the let's see another thing that. It's not really a game or anything like that. It's more of a technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I've talked about this on my YouTube channel or just here and there, more on um, like live streams and such. Uh, But it's something called SIOcast, which is spelled S-I-O cast, you know. And um, what it is, it's a type of, uh, it's 
So it's a machine that you buy that's smaller than like a fridge, you know, like a fridge you'd have in your nor- in your normal kitchen, not like a dorm fridge. It's still you know <laughs> kind of tall, but it's a yeah. Right. And what it is is um, normally when you want to make plastic miniatures, plastic miniatures have to go into a metal mold, whether it's right. steel or aluminum, and then it's an injection molded hot plastic into the steel mold. Mm-hmm. Those steel molds are very expensive to make. And even the aluminum ones are very expensive to make. Right. Whereas if you have a metal miniature or a resin miniature, you are then making the master of the whatever the sculpt is, and then you are pouring um, liquid rubber over the top of it, mm-hmm. which then hardens into what they call galvanized rubber, and then now you have a rubber mold. And it's usually two-part, but it could even be technically one part. It depends on the thing. Usually Mm two-part. And then spin casting and all that jazz. Um, This is the best of both worlds in that you are getting plastic, but it's not exactly the same plastic as like Games Workshop or Weird Games or whatever, but it's getting closer and closer and closer to it every time. Mm -hmm. But it's very high detail and... um, you're using rubber molds. So instead of a ten to fifty thousand dollar mold, you're talking about a two hundred dollar mold. Yeah. Which is a considerable difference, as it turns out. I'm not great at math, but I'm pretty sure. And um and so you know, the ability to be be able to produce these molds and then be able to start cranking out plastics out of them. Now, if you're a big company, this is of very little use to you unless you're working on limited run stuff. If you are a big company, let's say Games Workshop, and you mm-hmm. need to be able to crank out a lot of a particular model. Yeah, tens of thousands. It's much faster to be able to do it with steel, mm-hmm. obviously, with the injection molded plastic. But if you're a small company that doesn't want to do resin or metal and wants something that's a little closer to like nice high detail quality right, the plastic. the detail was amazing that they were showing this. Yeah, I, the... Um, I talked to the CEO for a bit, and he gave me a couple of models to take a look at and to take home. I'm going to paint one of them on uh, on Twitch eventually, probably after sometime after I get back from um, Adepticon. But yeah, it's this cool kind of skeleton guy, and um, his he's he's mostly one piece, but then his arms uh, he's got like a cloak on and a hood, and then in his arms he's holding like two small they're either big daggers or small swords, and. Uh, those arms get glued on into like sockets where his shoulders would be and everything like that. But the detail on everything was super, super sharp and really mm-hmm. nice. So that's really cool. Um, the cost thing is going to be the interesting thing. From what I understand, the machine is about fifty grand, mm-hmm. um, and I think that there are some. It, it can go higher depending on some of the pieces of equipment and add-on and stuff like that. Right. But I, I mean, mean, yeah, what we were talking about before, basically, almost your mold cost from before for like a single mold can exactly. almost cost that much. Yeah, exactly. Like a steel mold, like steel molds can cost as high as fifty grand, and now you've got an entire machine that's you know for doing this. And if you're a small company, you don't need super high volume, super crazy high, right. like GW style volume at Games Workshop, then yeah, this would be great. Now that there are already companies here in America that are using it. We know that Monster Fight Club has a couple of the machines and mm-hmm. uh, has been producing models for both their Bor- Cyberpunk Red and Borderlands. skirmish game and then their Borderlands skirmish game, which is not out yet, but it, they, they've been they've been making models for it for like you know, convention purposes and demos. Yeah, Gen stuff. Con last year had the, the like claptrap. Yeah, the little claptrap robot guy. I got him. Yeah. yeah, but well, I was yeah, and then but I also got like while I was there, I bought a bunch of uh, the um, a bunch of different models from the Cyberpunk line that I'm just going to use for other mm-hmm. stuff. And so that was really cool because again, like I said, the quality is really really tight. So it's great to see this technology changing and and you know and and getting better and getting more accessible to the smaller companies. Yeah, like uh, I think we heard at least two or three companies that were talking about, you know, either going in on their own or yeah. or, or renting out time from another one. Exactly. And, it, you know, it was basically filling the gap between 3D printing or going the full, full high end that it was like they could suddenly make that kind of that mid-range 1,000 yeah. to 5,000 I could see models. I could see distributors wanting a couple of these machines. Oh yeah, because you could put it in the warehouse and then just pay some, pay a couple of uh, people to work that machine and produce models either for some of the companies that you might have exclusivity with that you're working mm-hmm. with, or even just become a service industry. Some miniature company comes to you, or some you know, some small indie right. company comes to you and is like, "Look, we need you know two thousand of these guys, you know, and 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 two thousand of these guys, and two thousand of these guys, and that's what we need, or whatever these." are and in relatively low volume 
it would be, I think, still really profitable and useful, and also these oh, people yeah. would get decent-looking models. Yeah, and when you figure out that you're not having to ship this in from overseas or exactly. anything else, like, oh, yeah, the pricing yeah. is... So COCast, I think, is really interesting, and um, they're going to have a booth at uh, Adepticon. They did not have a booth at uh, Reno, but we I just bumped into... Um, it's interesting. I would actually think they would, they, it would be the other way around. You'd think, yeah. I, I don't know if it was like maybe like a too late and they didn't have the yeah. space. They were kind of they they had a bunch of information actually in the Titan Forge booth, mm. um, and so I, I kind of that's how I met up with the um, CEO and all that kind of stuff. But they're going to have I'm going to talk to them a bit more at um, at, at Adapticon because they do have a booth according to the exhibitor list that I've seen. Nice. Well, speaking of Monster Fight Club, indeed, um, I did stop by their booth, so I got to see some of the stuff that they've been working on that was, I don't know, I think some of it's shipped and some of it's just kind of came in that had, you know, had been kickstarted before, but, you know, they're waiting to have shipped or, well, I guess not even shipped, like, uh, produced in their, fa- you know, factory or whatever. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like, uh, uh, but yeah, there's stuff there. I mean, I remember when we saw their first trees. Two was it two years ago? Or three years ago now? Yeah, I think it was three years ago. They had the trees at Reno. Reno, yeah. they're right next. It was that was Reno, right next 20, to us. or was it 2019? It was 2019. Yeah, it was 2019. They're right yeah. next to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and now they've got the ice wilds, which is kind of like the winter version. But what the cool thing with that was the evergreens. Yeah, so they've got evergreen trees that kind of stack up, so you can make big ones, small Tall ones. ones. Yeah, yeah. And then they've got still like if, you know, they they were able to figure out you know what was neat was if you like on the big trees was if you took off the big you know thing of leaves the bear tree looked really nice yeah well the pine tree one does the same thing and looks like a bear pine tree like yeah like what you would see in like a swamp or something mm-hmm. like that um so that was pretty awesome i got to see some of the borderland new figures that they didn't have out yet um but and then it sounds like they're working on uh their next couple of lines um that we talked about uh of different types of scenery that i think are going to be pretty awesome and i think that those buildings that they kickstarted are just about to start shipping yeah right? those should be shipping as well yeah yep. yeah those are kind of cool because those buildings remind me they're like basically like city buildings but they're modular like aren't they like cardboard maybe or something yeah it's cardboard it's like colored cardboard and then the corners are plastic yeah 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 and then you can stack them and do all kinds of crazy stuff with them and um and that's very cool i could see the people who are into the marvel game being into that or people who are in any kind of you know, urban kind of s- s- sort of fighting, mm-hmm. you can do a lot of modularity, cool stuff with that, absolutely. Um, I'm not normally a uh, tabletop, or uh, sorry, a board gamer. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not, but I'm interested in, uh, luckily my wife is, so that there's a benefit there too, but um, the, I'm interested in the game that we saw. There was a spot uh, that they had, this was a new feature at the at the trade show where they just had a bunch of games set up. Like you, and then the people were like, they gave him enough space to be able to set up the game, you know, and like put all the cards in the right yeah, places. Initially it and was, all that stuff yeah, it was, yeah, it was supposed to be just so you could go take pictures and video as needed. But then, I think it kind of—I don't want to say it became a demo area, but definitely there's a person behind there who can explain everything to you. Yeah, have somebody from the company. So I don't remember what they actually called it. The media something or other room, I don't media remember. preview room, or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, in that, I discovered a game called Distilled uh, by Paverson Games, or Paverson. I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced. Mm, yeah. But um, yeah, P, uh, starting with a P, Paver, it's like Paver Sun. Uh, and uh, Paverson Games Distilled, and it's about distilling booze. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's got a lot of little bits, but it still looks pretty kind of cool. The artwork is all really interesting, and it's about booze, which I kind of like. I, I like whiskey, and it was funny because he was telling us, like, yeah, he like wanted he's like, the, he's he like, he originally like, it was just going to be about whiskey, yeah. and then realized, oh well, in other countries there's all kinds of other weird kind of boozes that we're not used to around here, mm-hmm. and if we want it to have a global audience, 
So they added in a couple different types of boozes that honestly I haven't even heard of before. And yeah. I'm not even talking about brand names. I'm talking about like types. Yeah, he's yeah, like, types. Yeah, like he's different like, types oh, of spirits. He's like, like this is the number one. And I'm like, I've never heard of that before. Exactly. Yeah. It was like a, there was like oh, this was the number one in Asia. You know, type of spirit. And it's not whiskey. And it's not vodka. And it's not rum. And it's like or sake or whatever. Yeah. No. It was it was a weird name that I can't yeah. remember. But I'm not great at that. But then I get to learn. See, by also yes. playing the game, and you know, yes. possibly it fun be, and education might be turned into a drinking game. Hard. Yeah. To say um but yeah it's so a drinking game about a drinking game kind of yeah well, that's uh, i mean mm. it's it's a little it's meta, meta it's yeah. a little meta but i'm okay with it mm. um yeah so uh, that's um i don't know if it's out yet i think it might be it might it, it was seemed like it might be because they were he was demoing at a distribution company yeah there was a distro there was a, a, dis- a distributor like right one of the many distributors that were at the show was right across the aisle from us in the booth and he was then demoing it there as well. Um, what was the name of that distributor? Frontline? No, Fun Again. Fun Again. Fun Again. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. You're right. Yeah, Fun Again uh, distrib- distribution is where they, he was based out of in the booth. So it's probably, or else it's just about to hit or about stores. To, yeah. Yeah, one of the two. But yeah, it's called Distilled. I found, to I, cause I couldn't remember the name of the company, and I did find it on um, Board Game Geek, so you could find more information over on Board Game Geek by just typing in distilled, most likely. Mm-hmm. Uh, so another one that I saw was a second edition, so basically a revamp of an original um, Castle Panic second edition. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Castle Panic was actually the first, like I would say, like official board game that I could play with my oldest son when he was... I think we figured out he must have been about like three or four at the time because mm-hmm. um, the game just turned 12 years old. Oh, yeah. Um, there you go. So uh, they've revamped it. Um, for the most part, the gameplay is still very similar, but mm-hmm. they've updated the artwork, um, polished some of the rules a little bit, um, fixed some of the stuff that was uh, kind of holding it back with some of the uh, expansions. Sure. Um and you know, overall, gave it a tweak, and then they also have a new expansion coming out uh, called Oh shoot, I think it's Quests and something, mm-hmm. but basically adds a, another dimension, another way, to, uh, like basically gives you, um, I think, with the amount of variations he was saying, because there's like there's an in-game quest and an end-of-game quest. Mm-hmm. Um, with those variations, like something like sixty-four variations of that you could play depending on which ones you draw at which time Mm -hmm. um, to play the game. And the way they did it um, with how things are separated, you can play with the first edition or the second edition because um, nothing has to be actually mixed together. So Right, yeah. Which I thought was a clever way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Because normally when the new edition comes out... Old edition's garbage, yeah. Yeah, you can't play new expansions, but they kind of kept it along. So, no, I'm... That's smart. Yeah, so I think it's great that that game's going strong and that they're kind of going to be introducing it to another, wouldn't be maybe a full generation, but no, you know, a new quite. set of gamers at least. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something definitely that maybe either you played as a kid or maybe you played it before you were a parent and now you're a parent. And yeah, no, that's, you know, I got to I, I gotta enjoy when it takes 12 years till you get a second edition mm-hmm. as opposed to, say, three years, you know, something like that. <laughs> um, no reason. Um you know how I mentioned before I'm, I'm not uh, necessarily into board games? Yes. Uh, I do like Fishman, though. And you love Fishman. I, I, I kind of, yeah. And so there's this uh, other game, actually, when we were in that same media photo, whatever, Hootenanny Room, uh, called Cult of the Deep by B.A. Games. B as in boy, A as in alpha. Uh, <laughs> B.A. Games. And um, Cult of the Deep has definitely... Like, it's not Cthulhu, but it's not not Cthulhu. You know what I mean? Like, there's cultists. It's Cthulhu and there's, adjacent. Yeah. It's Cthulhu adjacent. That's a good point. Yeah. And um, the artwork on it was super good. I really oh, liked yeah. the artwork. That, that, yeah, I immediately was like, ooh. Then, exactly, yeah. exactly. So I'm like, okay, good artwork about giant kind of evil sea monster-y type people and the cults that enjoy them. And, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that as well. And that is, I believe, out. Like there was at least yeah. enough. There was there was there was a rating for it on Board Game Geek. Yeah. The other game didn't have a rating yet, which sometimes leads me to believe that the game's maybe not necessarily out yet, mm-hmm. but or it's just come out. But this one's been out not for suit too long, maybe since last year, twenty twenty one, maybe, maybe. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Cult of the Deep I thought was very interesting. It's got uh, 
he was he was telling us about like some of the artwork and how the artwork kind of had to be done in a way so that you could have like a big piece of artwork, but then you could kind of zoom in and take parts of it for the cards. Ah. So instead of having just like having to make a bunch of extra pieces of artwork, you right. make one big one, but you position it in a way that like this cultist down in this corner, you can put him as card art, and then this one over here is another piece oh, of card art, and then this smart way to do you know it, yeah. fishman over here is a piece of card art. But they were all in one big tableau that's maybe on the front of the box or whatever that kind mm. of stuff. So it's uh, it was interesting to talk to him and kind of learn about. And he knew me from YouTube and such and everything. And so yeah, that it was, was funny because yeah, because we had to wear masks the whole time, even though right, we were yeah, yeah. we proved our vaccination status too, so yeah. we have VIP. Um, right, a very inoculated person. That's what I decided. At VIP. They but, just had these VIP wristbands, and they're like, okay, you have to wear this to show that you're you know got yeah, your vax. It was like, okay. odd, but. Because of that, everybody was face covered. So there was, there was more than one time where someone's like, "Sorry, I totally didn't recognize you without the mask." Sure, yeah. yeah. But then you know, we always laugh because p- people would recognize Adam from the voice. They're like, they, and it was like some of them, they you kind of see them like start to think and they're right, like, yeah. Where like, have I heard that? Voice you know, before? they'd be talking to like explaining what was going on at their booth, and I'd be like looking and nodding or whatever. And then I would ask a couple of questions or something like that, and then they would be like, "You get the squinty eyes," and they're like, "Why do I know this guy?" I can't tell from the face, and uh, yeah. yeah. So, but I also, I, well, it was weird. I also had a couple of people who just like were just walking by in the eye, just walking by like in a hallway, and they're like, "Hey, Uncle Adam," and I was just like, "Hi." Um, so, you know, that was that was cool. But um, yeah, Cult of the Deep I thought was very interesting, and it's a potential thing that I would buy that then I would play with my wife and some other folks. But then mm-hmm. eventually, probably she would just play with the the other folks, and then I right. might not play as much. But um, it's but got, you could enjoy the got cool fish mans though. Mm-hmm. What about you? Uh, this game got announced shortly before Reno, mm-hmm. um, but I'm very excited. I got to see some more of the stuff while we were there in Reno. Um, it is G.I. Joe, the board game. Nice. And it is from Renegade Games, and it is based on the rule sets that they from their um, uh, popular Power Rangers game. So the Power Rangers game that they've made in the past is almost kind of like a tower defense kind of game, right? Yeah, a little bit. And you, like, yeah, yeah, you're you're kind of like trying to clear the board at the same time. Yeah, like fighting off waves, basically yep. of those little gray dudes. Yep. And then you eventually might get enough that you can yeah clear off everything. And, and I'm assuming that you're basically fighting against Cobra in this. Yes, GI Joe against Cobra, and then send the Cobra, basically the putty patrol in this situation. I right. Suppose. Yeah. Okay. But, well, that's you know, cool. you got minis, um, and so I, you know, was never a Power Ranger guy growing. Yeah. Up no, that was kind of came later, um, but I was a GI Joe, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. man, to have a game that I really liked, like the rule sets and stuff. I, you know, even though it wasn't Power Ranger Guide, the game I thought was fantastic. Yeah, you guys, I didn't play it that day, but you guys played it. Uh, you and Jason and whatnot, and played it. And you were like, yeah. just to try it out. And you're like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. Yeah, and I've played it with my family a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I now to have it like in the theme that's kind of fun for me yeah um, yeah yeah I, i'm excited for yeah, it yeah not bad that's very cool yeah and uh this i mean we've been working with renegade games and uh, they've been putting out cool stuff and uh, i'm glad to see that um yeah I, I think it's gonna be cool i mean it makes sense in this situation because it's you're basically playing co-op to some degree against yep. you know the bad guys aka cobra in this situation um if there was a G.I. Joe board game based off of the way my brother and I used to play G.I. Joe, it would then be like two hours of setup on the stairs and then <laughs> yeah. um, one, and then about five seconds of throwing a book at all the setup and then having it all tumbled on the stairs and then my mom, my mom yelling at us. Uh, that was what we used to do for fun is just make these like little tableaus of all of our G.I. Joe guys and then knock them all down uh, by throwing the book at them, uh, literally. Uh, Conquest is a game from Parabellum. Parabellum uh, Games has been around for a while. We originally saw them at either 2018 or 2019. I think it was 2018. Gam. I think it was like our first time being there was their first time. Yeah, because they come they came out of nowhere as a miniatures company and just was like, hey, and they just dropped an amazingly big you know, group of miniatures, a lot of models all at once. Yep. Uh, they had a big trade show booth with really super well done graphics and all the whole hoot nanny. Yeah, I mean they put a lot of big names to shame with how crazily big their setup was. Yeah, and when just from from like and we'd never heard of them before, and all of a sudden you're mm-hmm. like, who are you guys? And um, so yeah, and, and now their game, their main game, which is called Conquest: The Last Argument of Kings, 
uh, is uh, mostly what we would call in the miniature industry a rank and flank game. So you're moving your models in like rectangles. It's like a plastic rectangle. You pull your models in there and you move them in a rank, in a flank or a rank or whatever. Anyway, uh, that's usually not my jam. I'm not super into those. Um, Kings of War does it that way still to these this day. Uh, Song of Fire and Ice? Yeah. Song of Vice and Fire. Ice and Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one from Cool Mini. They do that as well. Um, that's the way that... Um, uh, Warhammer Fantasy used to do it before mm-hmm. Age of Sigmar. And, um, but, you know, there's still people that enjoy that kind of thing, and that's cool. Now, they've done it smart in that the models are all on round bases. Right. And you set them into rectangular trays with the right size little hole to set them mm-hmm. into. Now, the reason for that is because then they, re- they released a game that is part of Conquest, but it's called First Blood, and it is more like Age of Sigmar in that you don't move the models around in rectangles. You pull them out of those rectangles and you have them on circle bases now and then you move them around in squads so they still have to stay in coherency and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then evidently, according to them, they are working on a third game which will use the same models. It'll be True Skirmish where you're going to have five to ten models nice. per side which are, that's what I'm, re- not that's what I'm that looking one. forward yeah. to. Yeah. Now, all that being said, like I said, they've got a whole bunch of different miniatures and they've been releasing more and more of them. The earliest miniatures they put out were very interesting but mm. the details were a little smooth. Mm-hmm. There was not a lot of sharp, defined details and things like that. They like you could tell these were cool sculpts, but uh, nothing was sharp or pointy particularly. And that right. is basically trying to save money on molds. Um, the more, basically, the more sharp detail that you have in the molds, the longer it takes to make the mold, and the more tiny, tiny, tiny little kind of almost like little tiny Dremel built drill bits on the end of a robot arm do they have to go through to make those incredibly sharp details. Mm-hmm. Um, they have changed their ways uh, because now they are making models. They're, all their newest models are incredibly high detail. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Yeah, like that uh, crazy orc riding, that uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex kind of thing. And yeah, whatnot. that was nuts. Yeah, uh, just, their undead uh, group is yeah. their faction or whatever. The new, the new undead guys are also really amazing looking. And they've got a bunch of new stuff. They've really been putting a lot of money into it, and um, their their newer models are really sharp. I started to notice it actually at Gen Con this last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, oh, hey, this new stuff is starting to look really nice. And yeah. uh, now they just keep they just keep going, you know, win to win. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, fo- the true skirmish game when it gets released because I'm definitely going to try that out, and the miniatures are pretty cool. One thing is that they're a little bigger than you may be used to. Mm-hmm. They're not... 40 scale, 40 millimeter scale, like um, the Marvel game, uh, but they're also not like 32 millimeter scale, like um, Games Workshop stuff is. Yeah. They're a little closer to, I think, I swear someone told me there that it's closer to like 38 millimeter. Uh, 38 which, was what was yeah. in my head too. So. Yeah, so um, you know they're a little bigger, but um, the benefit in sometimes bigger models is like it, not too crazy big, but just slightly bigger is that sometimes they're easier to paint. Honestly. Right. That's what I hear. And so um, I do want to pick up some of their new models just to try out. I don't know about that Tyrannosaurus, but I definitely want to try some of their newer stuff. Maybe yeah. their Undead would be cool um, and kind of go from there. But, yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing what they do, especially when they release this new uh, kind of rule set that's much more true skirmish. I'm definitely, definitely on board with that uh, and checking that out. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, so the last one for me is a game for by uh, a person named Dion Mixon. Dion, <clears throat> excuse me, Dion Mixon, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yep, uh, he was in the area that was, if I remember right, kind of like their scholarship introductory, like, invites I think group. they called it Horizons or something like yeah, that? So yeah, so it was a group for basically um, kind of allowing uh, new designers and companies mm-hmm. into the... Um, area, and then I believe they gave out like a scholarship or a prize. I think it was specifically people of color. It, yeah. I believe, yeah. But they had a whole area, like there was what, maybe half a dozen? Four or five, yeah. 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 Maybe six, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, different booths, and they all, each were like had a game, and then there was like kind of a contest or something at the end, and then they gave them more yeah, of a, and a, a we cash prize or something. Allowed to know who won for some reason. <laughs> well, yeah, they kind of they did it like like you know they I don't know that, yeah that was they they had like the presentation like we could hear it like we hear yeah, clapping right. and stuff, but that was so far away from where we were. Yeah, then, they announced yeah. everything like on the speaker except for who won. Right. Yeah. And then, but we weren't allowed because the 
We were supposed to stay with our booth because we're not allowed to close. Like it was right at the very end of the show. Yeah, it, it was a little weird. It was odd. These but, things always happen. But hey, at yeah. least you know overall, I think it was a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think I uh, I think that overall, this was probably the game I heard the most people talking about. Yeah, yeah. Especially from a board game in the entire facility. I think I think no matter what it had uh, where he was located, it would have gotten attention. It yeah. Was, uh, so it's called Design Eye. Design, design Eye, yeah. Uh, so if you look at Design Eye game, um, it sounds like he did a Kickstarter, or and but now you can buy the game directly from him. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, what it was is uh, he is a um, uh, designer by graphic tra- designer. graphic designer by trade, mm-hmm. and was trying to figure out how to teach kids what it, what a graphic designer does. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and how to be a graphic designer, and so the uh, the game was uh, is kind of interesting because it's very it's like white and black, so it's very like dis- distinct looking. Yeah, because um, it's lack of color, but um, in design we like to call that clean. Clean. Thank you. <laughs> See, a I, I, non-designer talking about designers, or we just haven't added the color yet. One of the two. One usually. of the two. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the game basically, as you're learning, is teaching you how to um it's teaching you stuff like the you know your uh your color wheel mm-hmm. uh, fonts mm-hmm. um like a serif versus a sans and all that yeah, um yeah. it was it's teaching you stuff like there's some there's some sketching and designing and pitching um areas to it where you're you know you're given kind of a random thing and you're you know like design this a new food chain with this parameter yeah, yeah. and let people vote on it type thing uh so yeah it was pretty cool he was talking about that um that uh some of the people uh you know some of the kids he taught actually would take these you know like the sketches they did during the game and then later bring that uh you know polish them up and turn them into their actual portfolio pieces um but yeah, I it was a very unique I you know game idea and yeah. just super well done it looked like. So, um I'm I'm excited about it. Uh, I'm actually going to be looking to see if I can get myself a copy. Yeah, yeah. That's the one downside to some degree about these this uh, this trade shows. There's times you're like, "Oh, that's super cool. I want to buy that." Oh, I can't buy that here. That's not a, that's not a, right. yeah, that's, that's not what we're doing here. Do, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, cuz not like they're bringing usually they're not bringing, you know, uh, a lot of material to sell. Now, right. that being said, sometimes they bring stuff to show, and then at the end of the show, they're like, we don't want to ship this home, and then they'll just sort of, like, I got a couple of things here and there. Mm-hmm. There was one year when Osprey was there, one of our first years, either 2018 or 2019, where they came by, and because we we've been talking to them quite a right. bit at the time, and they're like, "Hey, did you guys come by and pick up some stuff so we don't have to ship it." And we're like, "Okay, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we got crazy stuff, yeah, a bunch yeah. of stuff." So that was sort of nice, but in general, it's not a place you go to buy things. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, I thought Design Eye was very cool as, as well, and I was because I was watching some people playing it. He was like doing a demo at one point, so I would like to, uh, yeah, we'll have to definitely check that out mm-hmm. when it's available. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it was a good show. Uh, we, I think, you know, we had a decent amount of conversations about Game 4, not just the app, but also the work that we're doing now, uh, building web, web applications and websites and mobile stuff and things mm-hmm. like that for different, uh, you know, publishers and manufacturers and all that jazz. Yeah, there was a, a good talk about, a lot of talk about the game library yes. manager. Um, yeah. It sounds like there's a, a bunch of interest about us doing a pro version that could be kind of scaled up and so that. it would be more cloud based as opposed to just only you know everything's being stored on this phone versus there's three of us at this convention and we're all hitting the same right. know, cloud kind of accounts. You know, and right, kind of and, but it might do some stuff like, like we talked about uh, allowing you to kind of share information so that yeah you, know, you know we could you could see how many times this certain game's being played so that. You know, as your game of conventions coming up, you can see some of the new hot games that are coming up. That, yeah, absolutely. That may not even have hit BGG yet. Yeah, like what's getting checked out at conventions and stuff right. like that. Yeah, we we talked to some folks that were um, instead of a normal board game library, which you kind of expect seeing at like game mm-hmm. conventions, they do an RPG game library, which I had yeah. never heard of before. No, I wasn't aware yeah, of that. And so they were like, "This would be really great if you could put RPGs into it and stuff." And they're like, "Board Game Geek has an RPG." Uh, like database as well, yeah. Uh, and so if we can hook into that, we could you know potentially automate things a little bit more that way. So that'd be very cool as well. So yeah, that was it was it was, it was good to see people again after 
well, quite some time, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it was uh, good to get back out there. So that was that was enjoyable. It was a bit stressful getting there and getting home, but other mm-hmm. than that, uh, and yeah. also my feet hurt, but it was it was good. Yes, <laughs> it was good. Well, thanks again for listening to this episode of the Game 4 Podcast. If you've got questions or comments and you're watching on YouTube, please leave a comment below. If you're listening via your favorite podcast player or you just aren't into the whole YouTube comment section thing, then you can feel free to reach out to us via email at podcast at imgame4.com. You can also keep up to date with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check out our website at www.imgame4.com. That is www.iamgameforcom Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>